Hello, my name is Matt Gerbrick, and I'm going to talk about a couple concepts today called the con cognitive load theory and the cognitive theory of multimedia learning. It's important to remember, first of all, that the primary goal of us as instructional designers is to construct courses and content that maximize student learning. This process requires careful planning and considering students' prior knowledge and learning styles. This video is based on the Cambridge Handbook of Me Multimedia Learning, which is our textbook here you see. And specifically, this video is going to deal with cognitive load theory and multimedia learning and how they impact teaching and learning. So let's first talk about cognitive load. Not necessarily this kind of load, but it's the load that's imp imposed on working memory that's, being pro that's processing information. You must understand that working memory has got a very limited amount of space and time. Uh, limit, working memory is able to process or remember about seven items at a time and works for about 20 seconds. So I want to do a real quick experiment with you and see how well your working memory is functioning. There's 12 numbers here on this slide and I'm going to give you 30 seconds to remember as many of them as you can. Ready? Go! Well, how did you do? Hopefully you got about seven or more. And if not, then you may have been dealing with some things that are referred to as ex extraneous cognitive load, which we'll talk about here in a second. Uh, we've got this visual here that indicates the three different types of cognitive load that there are. There's extraneous, there's intrinsic, and there's germane. And the first one we're going to talk about is intrinsic. Intrinsic is about the imposing, is what, what the learning task is, is, uh, is doing towards your working memory. How much load is it putting on your working memory? And that is a personal thing. It's in, an individual based on their experience and their prior learning or prior understandings. Uh, that intrinsic value is something that we try and manage. Uh, it's not something that you can really change as an instructor. So let's use an example here. We have a beautiful dashboard here from a AMC Pacer. Very simple, steering wheel, AM radio, gas pedal, brake pedal, not, my, not very complex for a car. So imagine you're a 16 year old and you're just learning to drive. You've never driven before and maybe you're a little bit apprehensive about it. Your intrinsic cognitive load may be very high because this is a new experience to you. But this will help to simplify it if you're going to learn in a type of vehicle like this. Because intrinsic is, again, based on natural complexity, and it's, it's about the secondary information that must be processed. It's the load that, you, uh, that, that is based on how you perceive what's to be learned. If you think it's going to be difficult, then there's a good chance your intrinsic cognitive load will be high. Now take that same example and you're a f same person, 16-year-old, never driven before, and you get behind this dash and there's all these buttons and gadgets and electronics. Seeing that will probably increase your cognitive load uh, intrinsic. The second type of cognitive load is called extraneous. An extraneous cognitive load is, deals with high levels of interactivity that are due to poor design. It's about information that's unnecessary that's included into a presentation or a lesson. And this is one thing that instructional designers and instructors need to try and minimize. We don't want to have extra things. In this case here, all I want to do is drive or, or walk through the intersection or bike. But there's so many different lights here that I wouldn't even be sure where to start. There's so much other activity going on that this would, this would create a rather high extraneous level or of, of cognitive load. And again, this is something we want to minimize by reducing distractions and extra information that don't help us get to the learning objective and and to the, to the goal of lessons. There's a couple other examples of things that as I to go through this, you'll probably be looking at instead of, of looking at me. So this may be extraneous. Uh, the person that did this may actually have been under some extraneous cognitive load as well. And I thought this was rather appropriate as well for an example of being distracted and how 
uh, extraneous information, extraneous cognitive load can impact an individual. The third type is a germane type of cognitive load. It's the effective one. It is the cognitive load that is positive, that is dealing with someone who is learning and processing information from their working memory into long-term memory. So the cognitive load that's germane is the type that we want to have, and it's the type of that's the, the intrinsic and minus the extrinsic, it's that effective amount. I've got an example here, another video I'm going to show you real quickly that I made. And imagine this in terms of someone who's older or a novice who's trying to learn how to use FaceTime on an iPhone. And they're going to try and figure out, how do I use this? And, and see if you can identify some of the extrinsic cognitive load uh, items, some of the intrinsic things you could think of, and then the germane. In this example, I'm going to be trying to show a beginner how to make a FaceTime call using the FaceTime app on an iPhone. Intrinsic cognitive load could come from their lack of experience with using a smartphone and they may perceive that this is going to be a difficult task which would increase the load on their working memory. Extraneous cognitive load could come from seeing all the other apps on the phone and not knowing what they do or what they're for and so you might be distracted by the other apps on the phone instead of paying attention to the one that we should be using. And then, of course, what we would like to have is a germane cognitive load where the working memory is using all of its resources to try and process the information and put it into long-term memory. So if I were to design this lesson appropriately or correctly or better, I wouldn't start with this full screen of apps. I would actually either start here at this stage where you can see the icon for the FaceTime app or I would go ahead and be in the app. The other thing we want to talk about here is cognitive theory of multimedia and thinking of multimedia sometimes you get this picture here of, of a computer screen and, and uh, keyboards and technology and gadgets when actually multimedia is really just about, vis about seeing and hearing having those two different channels being utilized. Chalkboard and a lecture, reading a book and talking about it together, those things could be examples of multimedia. The cognitive theory of multimedia is based on three assumptions. The first one is called the dual channels. Dual channels is that the idea that we have uh, information that comes in visually and audio, via audio on two different channels. And for the most part, researchers and, and folks agree that this is this is accurate. However, there is some discussion or differing opinions about how written text is processed. What information channel does that come in on? And there's those that are of the representation mode who believe in that that say that visual text is processed as a verbal channel. Even though you're reading it with your eyes, you're verbalizing that internally and it's being processed through the audio channel. There's the uh, <clears throat> sensory mode folks who believe that it is done do, through the visual channel and that as you read things it's coming in through your vision, through your eyes and that is how it's processed. Regardless of those two differing opinions, the point of this is that you want to try and make sure you don't overload one of those two channels. You want to try and utilize both of them. Think about if you're listening to two different radio stations at the same time, both coming in through an audio channel could be rather distracting, or trying to watch two different things at the same time. They again may interfere with each other and actually be counterproductive. The second assumption is that there's a limited capacity. <clears throat> These are sticks of RAM which are going to a computer. And RAM is the type of working memory that a computer uses to handle processes that are actively uh, taking place. And what RAM does is it tries to process the items that are being done and eventually you would save those into long-term memory which you would consider a hard drive or an external hard drive. But the limited capacity just is kind of like what we talked about before with extraneous <clears throat> cognitive load that people have a limited amount of space and a limited amount of time to be able to handle information. And so we have to be uh, conscious of 
people's limited capacity. Then the last thing is active processing. And active processing deals with attending to relevant incoming information, organizing it into coherent representations, and integrating mental representations to other knowledge. So what does all that mean? It means being able to take, pro take information in through different channels and being able to organize it and figure out how it's going to be used and then remembering it. Uh, doing a puzzle, seeing the picture, being able to see the pieces, organizing them, putting them together to make a picture. The keys to successful active processing include selecting, organizing, and integrating. And a quality multimedia message must contain all three. For example, let's say I want to show how to build a shed. I'm going to show the materials and I may group them into categories. And then I'm going to show some steps about how we're going to build it. Take you through the sequence of how the shed will be completed. Cognitive load theory and cognitive theory of multimedia learning are similar in that they both are concerned with the amount of content that's presented and how the overall, what the overall focus is. Being sure that the content that's being delivered or presented is appropriate and is necessary towards getting you to the uh, end goal of your lesson. So again, you can think about the uh, intrinsic and sometimes think about that as the dual channels. You can think about limited um, capacity along with extraneous cognitive load, and you can think about active processing along with germane cognitive load. I hope this video helped you understand a little bit more about these two theories, and I hope you're able to implement them in your class as we move forward.